So let's start with the lecture and I hope we will complete it today. Okay. Right. So we have got two more groups which are administered parenterally and uh, one of them is uh, MLN analogs and the other group is in cretin mimetics. And uh, 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 in one of the in cretin mimetics is given orally as well, which is a new development. And the other thing is that uh, yesterday Jamal pointed out that uh, about uh, when I mentioned biosimilars, he said that uh, they are, that is bioequivalence, right? And I, maybe I give you a little bit of wrong information. Uh, I, what I mentioned was that um, uh, different doses, uh, which have got equivalent effect is bioequivalence, which is not correct, all right? That, uh, I was actually talking of um, pharmacological equivalence. So bioequivalence in between, I have um, one slide I checked about biosimilars and uh, <clears throat> bioequivalence. We'll discuss that uh, in a minute, all right? Uh, one quick uh, point about that. So let's start with MLN analog. This is uh, co-secreted with insulin. It is a peptide hormone. And this too is secreted from uh, the beta cells and they have got many functions. And these uh, are also decreased in uh, diabetes, right? Both in diabetes type one and di diabetes type two. So as I said, there are basically three problems in diabetes, at least three problems. One is low uh, insulin secretion. Number two, and I'm talking of type two diabetes. Number two is uh, peripheral insulin resistance. And number three is increased glucagon secretion. So what this does is it inhibits glucagon secretion. It delays uh, gastric emptying, which will slow down the absorption of glucose. So that means that uh, either we will reach a smaller peak or the peak will be delayed, right? It will be flatter. And it uh, acts as a satiety agent, which means that it decreases appetite. It produces a feeling of fullness of the stomach, right? And it is, of course, deficient in diabetic people. Uh, Pramlintide is a synthetic MLN analog. It is a peptide. And yesterday we discovered, we discussed that uh, <clears throat> peptides uh, are uh, not given um, uh, not given orally because they are destroyed uh, in the stomach. But um, you know we have got a lot of peptides. And you uh, might be surprised uh, to know that vancomycin is a peptide. Vancomycin is a glycopeptide. It is an antibiotic and it is given orally. And perhaps that's the reason it is not absorbed orally, right? And there are many others, like uh, for uh, example, in um, osteoporosis, we give periperidate, which is uh, an analog of parathyroid hormone. We have octreotide. All right, and uh, uh, what else uh, do we have? We have calcitonin. Uh, so we have got a lot of peptides that are used, okay? Uh, most of them are given subcutaneously. Right, so this is a peptide. Indication is adjunct to mealtime insulin therapy in patients with type one and type two diabetes. So it is uh, adjunct, it facilitates uh, or it supplements the action of insulin, but we have to be careful because there is a risk of hypoglycemia with the use of this drug, all right? And uh, this is a synthetic pramlintide that we use as a synthetic MLN analog. Administration is subcutaneous and immediately prior to meals. And this is an alert that when pramlintide is initiated, the dose of meal time insulin should be decreased by 50% to avoid a risk of severe hypoglycemia. And of course, adverse effects are nausea, vomiting, and anorexia. Like we said that it decreases ap appetite or it uh, produces satiety, right? Uh, the caution is that we should not mix it in the same syringe with insulin. And we should avoid 
it in patients with diabetic gastro gastroparesis, which means that the motility of the stomach has uh, reduced uh, due to uh, due due to damage to the vagal nerves nerve. Okay, uh, and it is due to uh, diabetes that the vagal nerve is damaged, which is a part of peripheral neuropathy, okay? And cresol hypersensitivity, one of the excipients that are used for uh, stabilizing this drug and hypoglycemic unawareness because the risk of hypoglycemia increases. So the patient, if he cannot recognize hypoglycemia, which could turn into an emergency, uh, we should be careful in such patients, okay? Then we go on to incretin mimetics, uh, and uh, it has been observed since a long time that oral glucose results in higher secretion of insulin than intravenous glucose. And the reason is release of these incretin uh, mimetics from the GIT, okay? The incretin effect occurs because in response to a meal, because in response to a meal, the gut releases the following hormone, and one of them is glucagon-like peptide, one and the other is GIP that stands for glucose dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, right? So GIP is easier to memorize. So see, see, incretin hormones are responsible for 60 to 70 percent of postprandial uh, insulin secretion. That is a huge effect, all right. And um, uh, injectable, uh, we have got <clears throat> many. Exenatide is one of them. Liraglutide, which I said had uh, has good effects on the heart, especially in heart failure. But lately there have been some studies uh, which show that the effect may not be there. But the study that uh, uh, that demonstrated that liraglutide has got a beneficial effect on heart failure was a very big study, and most of the people believe that. And um, um, Correspondingly, the use of liraglutide has increased a lot these days. Uh, Dalaglutide is another one, and exenatide is a peptide isolated from saliva of Gila monster, which is over here, okay? Right, so mechanism of action of incretin mimetics, GLP-1 and GIP, they again decrease glucagon secretion uh, and they stimulate insulin release and that will lead to a better hypoglycemic control or a lower blood glucose, right? So that is the mechanism of action and it has got many effects just like uh, uh, amylin analog, pramlintide, it has got many effects. The incretin mimetics are analogs of GLP-1, which is the endogenous protein that produce the following effect uh, as GLP-1. So again, increase in um, insulin secretion, decrease in glucagon secretion, uh, decrease in appetite, which is one of the reasons for weight loss as well. So increase in insulin secretion, decrease in postprandial glucagon secretion, slow gastric emptying, which will slow down the absorption of glucose, uh, acts as a satiety agent, which means it will decrease appetite, produce a feeling of fullness and beta cell proliferation, right? Um, well, I don't know how effective this effect is, but um, that is what is mentioned in many books, okay? Uh, consequently, some weight loss is achieved and postprandial hyperglycemia is reduced and hemoglobin A1c levels decline. Now, delaglutide is once weekly injection. Uh, 94% of the patients, because it is one week, once weekly, they find it easy to use. They find it more convenient, okay? It can help improve hemoglobin A1c and um, blood sugar numbers if you want to do fasting blood glucose. And it is not a weight loss drug, but um, two to six pounds on average are lost. Okay, now as <clears throat> you will see, and as I mentioned yesterday, that uh, uh, this uh, dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors, right? They have a similar, almost similar mechanism of action, but they do not cause any weight loss. That is the difference. Other actions are more or less the same. 
now pharmacokinetics being polypeptides, exenatide, and liraglutide must be given uh, subcutaneously. And uh, here it is, uh, subcutaneous use only. This is exenatide. Uh, and this one, you know, the thing is that polypeptides are very short acting. Polype polypeptides do not last for more than a few minutes. But there are certain uh, techniques, uh, um, pharmaceutical techniques, with which you can increase the life of polypeptides, right? For example, liraglutide has got a long half-life. It is about 12 hours or something like that. How do they do that? Uh, we saw that in case of uh, um, vancomycin, it is glycosylation, okay? And um, uh, this... Uh, Polyglycol. What do you could? Uh, what do you call this? Pegylated, pegylation. Uh, addition of polyglycol. Yeah? So pegylation is another way, and there are other uh, means by which they attach some adduct to the polypeptide, and that increases the half life. So liraglutide is highly protein bound and has a long half life, allowing one daily dosing. Exenatide is eliminated mainly via glomerular filtration and has a much shorter half-life. Because of the short duration of action, exenatide is injected twice daily, 60 minutes prior to morning and evening meals. All right, these things you have to memorize, but we have got another preparation. Once weekly extended release preparation is also available. And obviously these are some techniques um, uh, by the chemists that are used to prolong the half-life. So exenatide should be avoided in patients with renal failure. All right, so this is uh, semaglutide as I have written over here and it is given orally. Now, how does it work orally? It is absorbed orally, right? Uh, now, the thing is that they have uh, added an agent which is known as absorption enhancing agent. Whatever the chemical name is, we don't need to know that, but they have added with semaglutide an agent that enhances absorption, number one. And number two, it is taken up by endocytosis, by the enterocytes, because it is a peptide. It does not have any transporter, or maybe it has got some molecule to attach with. Uh, that's why it is endocytosed and then it is released on the other side and it enters the bloodstream, right? So this is one oral formulation and it has got different strengths. Um, we don't have to memorize the doses at this stage. And uh, this in this slide, we will only look at the main adverse effects, which is nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, right? Serious adverse effects, pancreatitis, renal failure. That is why if there is this existing renal failure, we have to discontinue the drug. And people, there are studies, not very strong studies, weak studies, that it has got association with certain cancers, right? And um, humans, we don't know about humans, but animal studies have found some associations. Right, so this is what uh, we are mainly interested in. Uh, now, let's do this question, okay? It's a 50-year-old obese woman with type 2 diabetes. She was found to have inadequate control of her disease two months after starting a therapy with metformin and glyburide. Right, so this is a good revision of the mechanisms of actions. All right, so the answer should be easy. I got one answer, which is D, which is the right answer. Uh, Jamal says it is D. Now, inhibition of dipeptidyl peptidase 4, they, they are different drugs, okay? Um, uh, we will come to these drug inhibitors of, now inhibitor, inhibitors of alpha glucosidase, they, these are there again, A carbose and megalitol and activation of adenosine monophosphate activated protein. This is metformin. This is the correct answer for exenatide. 
and um, uh, this adenosine sensitive channels this is for sulfonyl ureas and i got another answer from javeria which is d which is the right answer and phosphorylation of tyrosine kinase receptor can anybody tell me uh, which drug has this mechanism of action phosphorylation of ty tyrosine kinase receptor which means this drug has a receptor to which it binds and that receptor has got tyrosine kinase activity and we did that yesterday or day before yesterday right so this is insulin actually right so this is these are the gliptins alloglyptin sexagliptin citagliptin linagliptin these are a carbose and meglitol this is metformin um, these are sulfonyl ureas and glenides as well and this one is insulin so the correct answer is activation of glucagon like polypeptide one receptors okay Right, so now let's come back to the point that uh, Jamal discussed yesterday. I'll give you the difference between bioequivalence and biosimilarity, right? Uh, Jamal was right to some extent, but uh, there are differences as well. So, you know, we are getting a lot of generic medicines these days, which are much, much cheaper than the branded drugs. And biosimilars have been in use, I don't know, more than 15 years now. I think the first was introduced in 2006, right? So this is chemical synthesis and this is a biological source. Uh, the molecules are similar and they are smaller molecules. Uh, these are larger and structurally more complex molecules because their source is biological, okay? Uh, pharmacokinetic bioequivalence studies. Yesterday I mentioned pharmacologic bioequivalence, right? So here we require pharmacokinetic bioequivalence. Here we require, this is a much broader uh, method, you know, uh, we need pharmacodynamic studies, safety and efficacy data as well. And uh, uh, full data requirements on pharmaceutical quality. Here additional quality studies comparing the structure and biological activity of the drug as well. Now coming to this point by bio bioequivalence and biosimilarity, the difference is that bioequivalence um, uh, medicine release, the, the, which are the bioequivalent medicine is, it releases the active substance into the body at the same rate to the same extent, right? So this is mostly a pharmacokinetic property. But what we see over here is in biosimilar, a similarity in chemical structure, biological function, efficacy, safety, immunogenicity. So we are looking at uh, a much uh, broader, um, uh, much broader properties of biosimilars. All right. And uh, also remember that I said I said yesterday, if it is a biosimilar, not a generic medicine, so biosimilars have to add four alphabets in small case, which do not mean anything. They are just for identification, just like a drug code. So that is a code for biosimilar, and uh, the companies could choose any uh, alphabets in any order in out of those 26 alphabets, okay? All right, so now let us go on to the oral agents. Uh, so here we are, these three insulin and amylin and incretin mimetic, more or less they are injectables. Uh, we have biguanides, we have glenides in oral agents, sulfonyl ureas, thiazoridine dions, alpha glucosidase inhibitors, dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors, and sodium glucose co-transfer porter 2. So these are the main groups that we have in oral um, anti-diabetic drugs, okay? Uh, so they are used for treatment of patients who have type 2 diabetes but that is not controlled with diet. And treatment of patients who develop diabetes after 40, after the age 40 and have had diabetes less than five years. If a patient has diabetes more than five years, then many uh, physicians will prefer to start with insulin, all right? Um, and another point that I want to mention over here before, before I forget, so they have written these type 2 for type 2 diabetes, but uh, metformin is used in type 1 as well. And these DPP-4 inhibitors are also used in type 1 uh, along with insulin. 
So patients with long-standing disease have to be evaluated for addition of insulin to uh, oral agents. And in the end, I'll give you the stepwise guidelines that are still accepted by most countries, okay? So let's uh, look at this. Yesterday, I mentioned that uh, uh, how does the beta cell know that there is hyperglycemia? How does, you know, once it knows that there is a higher level of glucose in blood, uh, Jamal says that DPP4 cannot be used in type 1. Uh, uh, why, Jamal? I think I, um, I have read it somewhere. Uh, do you have any reference, uh, available reference over here? Because, you know, the reason is it decreases uh, glucagon secretion. That is what I think. But anyway, so... Uh, all of you should um, at time not available. Uh, I'm not sure about this, what it means. But anyway, see, we will have to further do uh, some search on this because Jamal is saying that um, it cannot be used and he has some reference. Maybe he will write it down for us. Uh, so, but do you agree with metformin? Let, let us ask Jamal about metformin. What, what's your... Um, Source. Okay, so metformin, Jamal says that he agrees with that, but for DPP-4, maybe we'll check out more references, whether it can be used for type 1 diabetes or not, okay? Uh, but I definitely saw studies in which it was written it could be used for a DPP, uh, this type 1 diabetes, right? So let's come back to this beta cell, and we were trying to figure out how does the beta cell knows that there is hyperglycemia or the blood glucose levels are elevated, they have gone up. So, you know, this, these are insulin vesicles, they are inside the cell, right? And there is preformed pro-insulin over here. So they are packaging in pro-insulin uh, molecule as well as enzymes that will cleave it. So this is a GLU2 trans glucose transporter. GLU for glucose and T for transporter. We have got four types, or maybe there are more, but there are at least four types of glu glucose transporters. Um, so it takes up glucose. You know, it doesn't need insulin or anything. If whenever there is high glucose, this will take up glucose. And when the glucose enters, it is metabolized and it is uh, oxidized and it produces ATP, right? And this ATP is going to bind to this potassium channel, right? This is ATP sensitive potassium channel. When ATP binds to it, it will close down. Now, you know that we have got a very high concentration of potassium inside the cell. Outside the cell, it is low 3.5 to 5.5 milli equivalents per liter. Uh, so when, when this channel is closed, potassium concentration is going to increase. Now, normally inside we have got a negative charge, outside a positive charge. So when the concentration increases of, of the positive charges, the membrane is going to depolarize, right? Potassium uh, concentration increases inside the cell and membrane depolarizes. And we have got voltage-gated calcium channels. They will open up when the voltage changes and calcium will flow in. And you know, this is the mechanism for release of vesicles in a lot of cells, especially in the nerve terminals. Again, it is voltage-gated calcium channels that open up, calcium flows in, and neurotransmitters are released. So the same way, insulin will be released uh, by the beta cell. So this is how the beta cell knows that the glucose is uh, elevated in the blood, okay? And that leads to release of insulin. Right, so before we go any further, there is another question. Please read it yourselves. All right. You should be able to answer this question. Okay, I got one answer, which is um, Jamal says it is E 
and Javeri also says it is E and that makes sense. What do we have over here? We have got uh, uh, elevated blood glucose, fasting glucose, and we have got elevated insulin as well, right? So when there is a lot of insulin, glucose should go down. It's not going down, okay? That means there is resistance in the peripheral cells. So the correct answer is, uh, so that's a hint. Uh, the correct answer is insulin resistance, right? Despite high insulin level, the patient has hyperglycemia. In other words, the patient has insulin resistance and the pancreas is responding by releasing higher amount of insulin because the blood sugar is not going down. So the beta cells are going to sense that and they're going to release more and more insulin. So we now go on to sulfonyl ureas. These are known as time-honored insulin secretagogues. They increase insulin secretion from beta cells of the pancreas. Uh, we use the second generation drugs these days and uh, the first generation uh, are not used. Uh, Jamal mentioned the other day that, that those were tolbutamide and tolpropamide. When we were students, those drugs were used, but now they are um, out of use. We use the second generation drugs which are gliburide, it's also known as clebenclamide. And uh, this is, it comes with many different brand names. Glipizide and glamipiride are there. Uh, so these are uh, mostly, you know, these are, when you have this national drug code, it means it is from USA. If the drug is from Canada, it will have DIN number, drug identification number, okay? And similarly in UK, there are different codes and uh, I'm not sure how we do it in Pakistan, okay? Right, so mechanism of action, um, increase insulin release from beta cells by closing ATP sensitive potassium channels that we saw over here when they close down, potassium concentration increases, the membrane is depolarized, right? And the voltage gated calcium channels open up. So this is the mechanism of action. It closes ATP sensitive potassium channels and that will lead to calcium influx and insulin exocytosis. Uh, it reduces hepatic glucose metabolism, but that this is the main effect, uh, main biological action, okay? It increases peripheral insulin sensitivity. These effects are there, but uh, as I said, the main effect is uh, it is an insulin secretagogue, and that is exactly the reason, you know, any drug that increases insulin secretion uh, will um, produce a high risk of uh, hypoglycemia. So uh, pharmacokinetics, it's taken orally, metabolism is in the liver, excretion both in kidney and feces, and duration of action is 12 to 24 hours, depending upon which one you take. Weight gain is an important uh, side effect because again, because of insulin release, you know, insulin also causes weight gain. It could lead to hyperinsulinemia. It could cause hypoglycemia, which is the main um, adverse effect. Drug interactions are there and risk of hypoglycemia higher in hepatic and renal insufficiency, all right? Uh, so that was it. And, you know, um, we have got certain oral agents which are known as, um, uh, I mean, they are well established and well recognized agents, all right? And this, these uh, sulfonyl ureas, as I said, they are known as time honored insulin secreta box. These are uh, well validated drugs, okay? So they are usually after uh, metformin, these are the ones that are added most commonly, but the trends are changing. As I mentioned, liraglutide is uh, very commonly uh, used these days as of, after uh, metformin. So gliburide minimally crosses placenta. It is alternative to insulin in pregnancy and glipicide and glamipiride are safer in renal dysfunction in the elderly. So elderly people above 66 years of age, you must do complete uh, um, labs for those people, especially the renal function tests. Okay, they're most of the times, I mean, in quite a few times, you will find that their GFR might be below 60. All right, another question. Uh, 
Ok. Right, I got one very quick answer, which is from Aisha, and Aisha says uh, it is A, which is perfect, which is the right answer. So let us see what these drugs to which group do they belong. This is a sulfonyl urea, this is biguanide, this is a glenide, alpha glucosidase inhibitor, and thiazolidine diones, right? So he's al allergic to sulfa. Uh, methoxazole, and these are sulfonyl ureas, which means they contain uh, a sulfur group, okay? So uh, sulfur allergy, these drugs are contraindicated. Right, now we go on to glenides. Again, glenides are also insulin secretagogues. So immediately, one of the side effects that should come to your mind is hypoglycemia. Okay, maybe a little bit of weight gain as well, because of in effect. So the two drugs that we have over here are repaglinide and nateglinide. Okay, so this is a list that we will refer to again and again, alpha glucosidase, sodium glucose co-transporter, dipeptide and peptidized inhibitors, thiazolidine dions. Okay, so anyway, at the moment we are doing um, these uh, glenides and uh, here they are, you know, this is repaglinide, they come as tablets and nateglinide also comes as tablet. So the route of administration is oral. Mechanism of action, stimulate insulin secretion by closing ATP sensitive potassium channels. Same action as sulfonyl ureas. Uh, they are categorized as postprandial glucose regulator. They cause immediate release or early release of uh, insulin after a meal, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, there is a caution, don't use in combination with sulfonyl ureas because both have the same mechanism of action. So there is going to be a serious um, uh, hypoglycemia that could develop, all right? Okay, pharmacokinetics, uh, oral before meals, uh, that is how they are administered. Metabolism is P450. So beware of the drug interactions, excretion is in the bile. Adverse effects are hypoglycemia and weight gain, but they are less than sulfonyl ureas. They are more potent and more efficacious drugs, okay? Um, drugs that inhibit CYP3A4, you know these drugs, you know, etraconazole, fluconazole, erythromycin, these macrolides, many other drugs. Uh, we have got certain, um, you know, antiviral drugs that suppress this thing. And the drugs that induce all well-known drugs, you know, barbiturate, carbamazepine, rifampine, phenytoin, okay? Uh, so rifampine, I think that is the strongest inducer. So when the drug is induced, they will be metabolized faster. And when, sorry, when the CYP3A4 is induced and when this enzyme is inhibited, they will not be metabolized and they may have toxic effects due to high levels. All right, so gemfibrosal, which is which we have already done. It is a lipid lowering drug, inhibits hepatic metabolism of glenides. It may significantly, significantly increase the effect of repaglinide and concurrent use is contraindicated, right? Because that is going to lead to serious hypoglycemia. And also you have to be careful in patients with hepatic impairment because it is metabolized by the liver, okay? Right now we go on to metformin, very old drug. When we were students, we had two drugs. One was metformin and the other was fenformin, which has been taken off the market since a very, very long time uh, because of uh, serious uh, lactic acidosis that it used to uh, uh, create in, in the patient. Uh, so metformin these days is the only biguanide that is the first line treatment. It is known as insulin sensitizer. It has got two or three effects. Insulin sensitizer means it makes peripheral tissues more sensitive to insulin, right? But this is not the main mechanism of action. Uh, so here are, we have got different preparations, you know, glucophage or glucophage, whatever you want to call it. That is the most common one. It increases glucose uptake because it sensitizes the tissues to insulin and used by target tissues, thereby decreasing insulin resistance, okay? 
Metformin does not promote insulin secretion. So therefore, the chance of hypoglycemia is far less than with sulfonyl ureas, okay? The main mechanism of action is reduction in hepatic gluconeogenesis. So hepatic gluconeogenesis is the main mechanism that causes hyperglycemia in many situations like in emergency situations, right? And that is the effect of cortisol. Uh, excess glucose produced by the liver is a major source of hyperglycemia in type 2 diabetes mellitus. So this is a good drug for that. And American Diabetes Association recommends metformin as the initial drug of choice for type 2 diabetes. But obviously it depends how long has the diabetes been there, right? If, the, if uh, uh, you find the blood sugar levels or hemoglobin A1C too high, then obviously you're going to uh, take a more aggressive approach to treatment. Uh, mechanism of action, reduction of hepatic gluconeogenesis, uh, peripheral sensitization, uh, or in, um, I mean, it will decrease insulin resistance, improve peripheral glucose uptake and utilization. Weight loss may occur because of loss of appetite. So again, a good point for obese people. And you know, a lot of uh, type 2 diabetics are obese. A metformin can be used alone or in combination with other drugs. We start with this. We can go up to 2,000 milligram, right? You know, one, this is an 850 milligram tablet, quite an unusual dose. I think uh, um, they are found in some countries, right? But the thing is, C850 milligram. So some guidelines lines recommend you can give 850 milligram three times a day, which about goes to more than uh, 2,500 milligram per day, right? So that is the maximum dose you can give in one day. A risk of uh, hypoglycemia increases when metformin is taken in combination with insulin secretagogues or insulin itself, right? So we may, may need an adjustment of dosage in those cases. And pharmacokinetics, it's well absorbed orally. It is not bound to uh, serum proteins. It is not metabolized and excreted in the urine unchanged, okay? Uh, remember this point because I'm going to ask you a question later on, okay? Right, there is one comment which is, uh, uh, this Muhammad Jamal has raised a good point. He says 2,500 milligram dose can cause lactic acidosis. And there is a question mark. Wait a little, we'll, we'll look at that, okay? Uh, we will look at the risk of uh, lactic acidosis, right? Uh, adverse effects are mainly gastrointestinal. Long-term use may interfere with vitamin B12 absorption. So maybe you want to give vitamin B12 to the patient. Supplements and caution in patients older than 80 years, mostly because of reduced renal function. And if the renal function is reduced, the risk of lactic acidosis is going to increase. Heart failure, again, same reason, heart failure, lower renal perfusion, greater risk of lactic acidosis. Alcohol abuse, uh, it must be discontinued in patients requiring IV contrast media. Other uses, polycystic ovarian syndrome. You know that in this syndrome, there is excess production of androgens and that causes loss of uh, ovulation, which are known as N ovulatory cycles. So we, um, we have got other drugs uh, for that. Uh, uh, anybody remembers the drugs? Clomiphene, clomiphene is one. Uh, letrozole. letrozole is also used to, for uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, but uh, metformin uh, works by um, um, lowering insulin resistance that will cause ovulation, okay, and it could lead to pregnancy. So on the other hand, if a woman uh, does not want to get preg pregnant and she is on uh, uh, on metformin, she has to use uh, contraceptive methods, all right? So risk of lactic acidosis and renal failure, one situation uh, to, answer, um, um, uh, to answer Jamal's question. So any other risk, added risk of renal failure that would increase on its own, uh, it, is, it is used so commonly. And as I said that 
In many countries, 2,500 is the upper limit of the dose and it is used in many people before going to another drug or before adding any, another drug. So the risk of lactic acidosis will increase if there is any other condition that um, can potentially produce acidosis, okay? And you know that renal failure is one of those conditions. Discontinuing conditions that can cause renal failure such as myocardial infarction, acute decompensated heart failure, sepsis, you know, and all of these drugs, renal perfusion is reduced, you know, and uh, bicarbonate will not be absorbed, you, urinal tubular acidosis, or you can get acidosis due to increased carbon dioxide in the blood, okay? So uh, in these conditions, we do not use it. So glucophage, 1000 milligram, uh, the common preparations are 500 milligram, all right? And let's look at this question. All right, so I didn't get any answer so far. Uh, what condition could chronic obstructive pulmonary disease lead to, right? Chronic obstructive pulmonary uh, disease could cause uh, a persistent increase in uh, PCO2, right? Partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Okay, so that means respiratory acidosis. So another condition in which metformin will be contraindicated, any condition that causes acidosis in, in, case, of, uh, in case of renal disease, it is metabolic acidosis. In chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, it is respiratory acidosis, all right? And by the way, uh, I hope you remember that the, the, the cells in the, or, and the chemoreceptors in the carotid bifurcation and the cells in the respiratory center, they are sensitive to raised carbon dioxide levels. So breathing increases whenever the carbon dioxide level increases. They're also sensitive to low pH, which means high concentration of hydrogen ions. So these two uh, will increase the breathing rate, okay? But in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, the cells get adapt adapted. They don't respond to uh, carbon, high carbon dioxide and they don't respond to low pH uh, because this condition goes on for years, okay? What are they responsive to? Now they are responsive to oxygen, the last result, okay? So that is why um, when you have to give oxygen to COPD patients, but you have to keep it uh, at a low flow, right? You cannot give a very high uh, concentration of oxygen to those patients. All right, so metformin is the right answer. COPD causes chronic respiratory acidosis. Captopril blocks aldosterone. Low levels of aldosterone can cause metabolic acidosis uh, and um, high levels can cause uh, alkalosis. Metformin can cause lactic acidosis, albeit rarely, but it is contraindicated in conditions predisposing to acidosis, okay? Right, so which of the following anti-diabetic drugs should not be given in chronic kidney disease? All right, so I got one answer and clearly the answer is C over here, and which of the following anti-diabetic drugs is excreted or are excreted unchanged in urine? And uh, we have so far mentioned only one. Uh, D is definitely right. And uh, some people has, have answered C. So C is also correct and A is also correct and B is also correct, right? So all of these drugs are excreted unchanged 
in urine, okay? All right, so now let us go on to thiazolidine diol. So we have done sulfonyl ureas, which includes gliburide, glipizide, and glimepiride. We have done glenides, repaglenide, and metaglenide. They are both insulin secretagogues. We have done metformin. And now we are going to thiazolidine diols, which has got two drugs, pioglitazone and rosiglitazone. And we will come to acarbos, miglitol, and uh, gliflozins and gliptins later on, okay? So pioglitazone and rosiglitazone, um, they are insulin sensitizers, right? They work through genes. Uh, these are the brand names that uh, you may want to uh, remember or you already know that if you are clinicians. So they require insulin for their action because they are insulin sensitizers, okay? Uh, but do not promote insulin release from beta cells. Uh, so hyperinsulinemia is not a risk, okay? So American Diabetes Association recommends pioglitazone as second or third line agent for type two diabetes. And previously we discussed that rosiglitazone was the drug which was thought to cause uh, heart problems. Uh, rosiglitazone possible cardiac adverse effect because of water retention, but a big trial, I've forgotten the name of the, that trial, a big clinical trial was conducted with thousands of patients in about 2008. And um, their final conclusion was that it does not have any more increased risk than pioglitazone, okay? Right, so PPAR gamma is a nuclear hormone receptor. So these drugs work through PPAR gamma, the thiazolidine diones lower insulin resistance by acting as agonist for peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma, okay? And uh, when, when they activate this receptor, it will translocate to the nucleus. Uh, transcription of several insulin responsive genes resulting in increased insulin sensitivity in the adipose tissue, liver, and skeletal muscle. These are the three main places where insulin works, okay? Uh, so effect on thiazolidine dions is again interesting. And again, there are differences between rosiglitazone and pioclitazone. The good effect of both these drugs is that they both increase a high density uh, um, LDL, you know, sorry, HDL, high density lipoprotein cholesterol. Uh, but effect on triglycerides and LDL is different. Rosiglitazone increases LDL cholesterol and triglycerides. Obviously, in the long run, LDL is not good for heart, okay? Pioglitazone decreases triglycerides, so it has got two good effects. So that is why most of the physicians, they prefer pioglitazone over rosiglitazone, okay? So two good effects, decreases triglycerides and increases HDL. And this has got two bad effects and one good effect, okay? The thiazolidine dions can be used as monotherapy or in combination. Uh, I am not sure that if it is used in uh, as monotherapy uh, because it is not even a validated drug, okay? Well, it is not a well-validated drug. And like you saw in the previous, uh, uh, previous slide that the American Diabetic Association recommends it as a second or third line drug, okay? The dose of insulin may have to be lowered when used in combination with these agents because it increases insulin sensitivity. So the risk of hypoglycemia might increase, okay? And we are talking of type two diabetes, right? So these are the pharmacokinetics. Absorption is very good from GIT. Albumin binding is extensive. Al extensive albumin binding also has got a bad effect. Any drug that displaces it from uh, albumin binding site will cause drug toxicity, okay? Uh, metabolism, CYP450, another reason for drug interactions. And metabolite pioglitazone has active metaboli metabolites and rosiglitazone has none. Uh, elimination pioglitazone liver and rosiglitazone renal, but remember that it is safe to use in, uh, uh, in uh, renal insufficiency, okay? Many studies have shown that it is safe to use in renal insufficiency. So that is why in renal uh, dysfunction, no dosage adjustment is required for any of these, okay? 
and nursing mothers, you have to be careful with every drug. Right, so monitor liver function. A few cases of liver toxicity have been uh, reported um, and uh, unload fast. You know, they worsen heart failure, they can cause fluid retention and subcutaneous fat accumulation. These are not very good effects and uh, they can cause decreased bone mass density and osteopenia. Uh, osteopenia does not lead to fractures, but osteoporosis does, okay? Can anybody tell me what is osteopenia in terms of T-score? You know, we calculate a T-score. There is a special X-ray for uh, postmenopausal women, you know, who have got a high risk of developing osteoporosis. And that uh, stands for DEXA, DEXA stand, uh, dual energy X-ray absorptionometry, okay? So we calculate a T-score over there and uh, T-score means that we are comparing the bone mass density with the bone average bone mass density of young people, right? If the patient is 56 years old, his or her bone mass density will be compared to the average bone mass density of young adults, okay, of the same sex. Um, so it always goes in negatives. So up to, up to minus one is normal, zero to minus one is normal, minus one to minus 2.4 is osteopenia, okay? After that, minus 2.5 onward is osteoporosis, and as it becomes more negative, the risk of fracture increases more and more, okay? So pioglitazone, increased risk of bladder cancer, uh, well, that is what they have found in many studies. The reason obviously is not known. So let's look at this question. Okay, so you get 90 seconds and Aisha has written D, which is the right answer. You have to answer all these cases in 90 seconds. Sometimes they are much, much longer than what I've written over here, it's specifically the stem, right? So D is the right answer. Slowing glucose absorption is uh, uh, alpha glucosidase inhibitors and blockade of potassium channels. These are uh, sulfonyl ureas and uh, glenides activation of adenosine monophosphate activated protein kinase. Uh, this is metformin and this of course is the correct answer over here. Now we go on to alpha glucosidase inhibitors, which are over here. We have got two drugs, acarbose, which is not absorbed in the GIT and we have got miglitol, okay? And uh, we have done sulfonyl ureas, glenides, biguanides, thiazolidine dions, and now let's look at this one, acarbose and miglitol. Acarbose is poorly absorbed from the GIT. This one uh, is absorbed. It is metabolized primarily by intestinal bacteria. Some of the metabolites are absorbed and excreted into the urine. Miglitol is well absorbed, uh, but has no systemic effects, okay? It is exchanged unchanged by the kidney that we saw in uh, one of the previous questions, okay? it was miglitol and it was metformin and it was um, uh, two glenides, okay? Um, linagliptin and perhaps it was cetagliptin. Uh, no, I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, we will come to that in a minute. Right. Okay, so let's look at the mechanism of action of alpha glucosidase inhibitors. Mechanism of action, alpha glucosidase enzymes are located in the intestinal brush border. What, did, what do they do? They break down carbohydrates, you know, polysaccharides, disaccharides into monosaccharides, into glucose. Glucose is a monosaccharide, right? Uh, so it is monosaccharides that are absorbed. A-carbose and miglitol reversibly inhibit alpha glucosidase. So this is, you know, it is showing over here that um, this alpha glucosidase, these are polysaccharides, disaccharides, and they're breaking them down into monosaccharides, right? And these will be absorbed in the body. Uh, when taken at start of uh, 
Um, these drugs delay the digestion of carbohydrates, resulting in uh, lower postprandial glucose. So when you take it before the meals or at the start of meal, it will decrease postprandial glucose. And you know, when you give them, you see that they are not broken down. Here you see monosaccharide, monosaccharide, monosaccharide when alpha glucosidase is active. When it is blocked, you all you are seeing are polysaccharides, all right? So they will not be absorbed. Monotherapy with A carbose and miglitol does not increase in insulin release, therefore does not cause hypoglycemia, but uh, I don't think anyone is going to use A carbose because it has got some, uh, or both of these drugs, you know, particularly A carbose has got GI side effects. However, there is a risk of hypoglycemia when used with insulin secretagogues. Note it is important that hypoglycemia in this context can be treated with glucose because glucose is a monosaccharide. It does not need to be broken down uh, and not sucrose because sucrase is also inhibited by these drugs. Okay? Adverse effects are flatulence and diarrhea, abdominal cramping, and it is the adverse effects that limit their clinical use. Contraindications, inflammatory bowel disease and intestinal obstruction, okay? Right, that is easy to understand because their effect is in the GIT and they will cause malabsorption of carbohydrates and thereby they will increase the intestinal motility, sort of osmotic effect, okay? Now we are going to dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors and um, it's already 55 minutes, but I uh, mentioned that we might have to go a little longer to complete uh, this lecture today. So let's go on to these al alogliptin, sexagliptin, linagliptin, cetagliptin, perhaps there are a couple of others as well. And uh, these are the brand names over here. Uh, if you want to uh, remember those, because when you go to your clinics, you usually remember, you know, write the brand names. Okay, so mechanism of action, we have seen what incretin hormones do. They decrease glucagon, they increase insulin release, and they lower blood glucose, right? But these hormones are inhibited by DPP4 dipeptidyl peptidase 4 enzyme, it inactivates them, okay? So it is going to block all these reactions and instead of lowering blood glucose, we will get elevated blood glucose levels, right? So that is why we give dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors. And you inhibit this and this will not be inhibited, right? So that is again going to uh, go there again going to go through this downstream effect okay and these drugs do not cause a feeling of fullness and they do not increase weight okay and they also do not decrease weight so otherwise the mechanism of action is the same what did we have for glp1 inhibition of glucagon and stimulation of insulin and delayed gastric emptying, we had uh, a feeling of satiety, full stomach, okay? And one of them was um, a hyperplasia of beta cells, uh, which uh, I don't know how effective that is in case of these drugs or in cretin mimetic. Maybe that is possible in normal people, but we won't give these drugs to normal people. So DPP4 inhibitors may be used as monotherapy or in combination with sulfonyl, ureas, metformin, thiazolidine, diones, or insulin. So what we have seen so far is that there is an option for using all the drugs that we have seen so far as monotherapy. But the recommendation, and it is a strong recommendation by most of the guidelines, you know, that the treatment should be initiated with metformin. Okay, and you know, in, in many cases, like uh, previously we saw in hypertension that sometimes there, is, there are differences in the guidelines, not major differences, but minor differences are there in US guidelines or Canadian guidelines, Australian guidelines and European Union has got a combined guidelines, right? UK sometimes has got different guidelines which are known as NICE guidelines, okay? Uh, so anyway, major differences are not there. Uh, and it is obviously the physician's preference, uh, what type of therapy he starts, okay? 
Now, pharmacokinetics, uh, you have to memorize that. I'll quickly read through this. Absorption, well absorbed from GIT, food does not affect absorption. Excretion, alloglyptin, linagliptin, sex, uh, sexagliptin is uh, renal. Um, and uh, linagliptin, uh, you know, sexagliptin is metabolized by active uh, metabolite. Okay. Uh, so, well, the thing is that dose adjustment in renal dysfunction work function except linagliptin, okay? So I was right. Um, these uh, linagliptin, sexagliptin, elogliptin, these are all uh, excreted unchanged in the urine, okay? Adverse effects, uh, well tolerated and uh, pancreatitis, nasopharyngitis, headache, you know, these adverse effects come out of nowhere, so we don't know the reasons. Strong inhibitors of CYP3A4 increase the levels, and I've mentioned that previously there are some more retinoville, which is known as a booster, and at a xenoville, which is a protease inhibitor uh, antiviral drug. This is a traconazole antifungal drug. Clarithromycin is a macrolide, and I hope you know all these drugs. All right, now we go on to sodium glucose transporter. We have seen, uh, these are the same slides that I showed you in heart failure, okay? So we have got canagliflozin, depagliflozin, empagliflozin, and there are a couple more, I think, these days. Uh, once daily dose in the morning, canagliflozin should be taken before the first meal of the day. Metabolism is glucuron addition, which will make it water soluble. And canaglifosin, mainly via feces, about one third is renally eliminated. Uh, there's just one point that I would like to go back over here. Uh, see, dosage adjustment in renal failure, failure except linagliptin. Although linagliptin is, uh, uh, is secreted or excreted renally, right? So why not in case of linagliptin? Because it has got, uh, uh, because it has got an alternative uh, pathway of meta metabolism and excretion, right? Okay, so many of them are uh, really are excreted unchanged, but this has got an alternative pathway. That is why in uh, renal dysfunction, this could be used, right? And the others could not be used, right? I have a comment over here. Uh, safe in renal failure, linagliptin, right? So because it has got an alternative way of excretion or elimination from the body. Thank you, Jamal. That was a helpful comment. And uh, now let's look at the mechanism of action. And if you remember, it is the same slide. This is the glomerulus. This is the Bowman's capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, and loop of NLA, distal and uh, this is where we have got SGPT2 uh, transporter, which will transport sodium, you know, SG, sodium glucose, S for sodium, G for glucose, um, uh, uh, and uh, transporter, you know, uh, for, uh, uh, and we have the same transporters in the intestine as well. They transport glucose through sodium concentration gradient, okay? So SG, sorry, not SGPT, SGL2, uh, sodium glucose transporter 2 is responsible for reabsorbing up to 90% of glucose. 100% of glucose is reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule, but they have a limit. Anybody knows the limit? After which, and that's the plasma level, after that plasma level, it, the, the capacity to reabsorb is exhausted and glucose will appear in the urine. So urine will be positive for glucose, okay? Anybody knows that blood level? For, um, for glucose, it is 180 milligram, okay? 180 milligram uh, per deciliter for, uh, that is the threshold, okay? After that, it will appear in the urine. So this is a blown up view. This is the proximal convoluted tubule. And these are the tubular cells, highly metabolic cells. They're doing a lot of transport and they've got many, many uh, sodium potassium ATPases as well. So here is the GLUT2 on, on 
this one sodium glucose on this side this is glucose it will take glucose in through through the sodium um, gradient and GLUT2 on this side will bring it back into the blood. So 90% of glucose is absorbed by these transporters. And if you uh, block them, then glucose will not be reabsorbed. It will be lost in the urine. Okay. So that is how uh, we get rid of glucose from the body. One of the ways And when we were doing heart failure, we said that this drug has got such beneficial effect on heart failure that now it is uh, in, in included as one of the first line drugs in heart failure, okay? By inhibiting SGLT2, these agents decrease reabsorption of glucose, increased urinary glucose excretion and lower blood glucose, okay? SGLT inhibition also decreases reabsorption of sodium and causes osmotic diuresis because so much of glucose is going down the tubules it is going to cause osmotic diuresis and it is going to have certain adverse effects. It has some um, good effect on blood pressure, systolic blood pressure as well, but uh, it's not used for hypertension, okay? Adverse effect, the most common adverse effect is genitourinary infections, female mycotic infections, uh, vulvovaginal candidiasis, uh, urinary tract infections, increased urinary frequency because of osmotic uh, diuresis. Hypotension has occurred particularly in the elderly. So elderly, poor people, their blood vessels are hard, right? Um, the, that is uh, known as, um, well, what is that known as? One is atherosclerosis and the other is arteriosclerosis, okay? They become hard because of sclerosis. So their blood pressure fluctuates a lot, a little bit of dehydration, they become hypotensive. Uh, the volume status should be evaluated prior to starting these agents. Other agents, you know, bromocryptine, uh, this is a dopamine agonist, okay? Um, I don't think anybody will use it as this glucose lowering effect, but if you remember, this is used in menstrual irregularities. Uh, bromocryptine is also used in pituitary tumors, in growth hormone excess. It is also used in Parkinson's disease, if you remember. Cholecevalam is a bile acid sequestrant. So the mechanism is, again, unknown over here. There are some safety concerns which have been published. Uh, Drugs increased risk of leg and foot amputations, but I don't think that is going to stop anyone from prescribing these drugs from, they are so rare, okay, uh, from uh, prescribing these drugs for uh, diabetes or for heart failure or heart conditions, okay. Type, in type 2 diabetes, adding semaglutide uh, improves glycemic control, semaglutide 2 SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, so this was an industry supported trials. Most of the trials, you know, the companies pay for that. They have the money, okay? So 300 people were there. So the bottom line is that this is a good combination. Right. So it was a randomized controlled trial and the results were good. Canagliflozin cuts renal CV risk in type two. So this is again a good effect, renal protective for the heart and protective for uh, the kidneys as well, okay? And diabetes class two associated with fournier gangrene. Fournier gangrene is uh, a gangrene of the perineal areas in, in men, maybe scrotum as well. I think it's written somewhere over here. Uh, inhibitors are associated with increased risk of fournier gangrene. Uh, what is it? reported in 70% of in six years, some 55 cases, okay, 55 cases were there and it was reported in 70% of men, okay? Yes, so here it is, gangrene of perineum, penis and scrotum in men, okay? So that is one of the side effects and I think that is all for today. Let's do this question and I think that should be all.
All right. So the answer is B, which is metformin. Uh, uh, C, belching, flatulence, diarrhea, abdominal pain. No, not metformin. It's not metformin. You have got a better answer over here. It must be something that is causing some sort of mal malabsorption. And the answer is C, which is miglitol, which is the right answer because it will uh, it will uh, impair the absorption of uh, carbohydrates, and those carbohydrates are going to cause all these symptoms in the GI tract. Okay, right. So alpha glucosidase inhibitors are approved for type two as monotherapy, and in combination, this side effect occurs in more than fifty percent of the patients and. We have seen this is one of the reasons for non-compliance by the patients. These adverse effects are due to fermentation of carbohydrates in the small intestine. They have a modest effect on postprandial blood glucose and they are taken before meals, all right? And here are the guidelines, okay? So uh, this is what uh, the guidelines recommend. Step one is lifestyle modification plus metformin. Okay, depending upon the blood glucose, fasting blood glucose levels that you do two or three times, or hemoglobin A1C, if it's above 7%, then you have to initiate the therapy. Uh, if it is still more than 7% or equal to 7%, then you add well-validated co-therapies. And in well-validated therapies, the best drug is sulfonyl ureas or less well-validated co-therapies. So here it is lifestyle metformin plus sulfonyl ureas or lifestyle metformin, you start with basal insulin. That is one of the option, although it is the next step, but it depends upon you. <clears throat> and these drugs are GLP-1 agonists and uh, uh, metformin pioglitazone, you can see over, see over there. And again, you add to them sulfonyl ureas. These are just guidelines, you know how you treat, which drug you add is up to you. And eventually, you know, uh, the step three is that we start metformin plus intensive insulin therapy. And these guidelines are obviously for type two diabetes mellitus. And this is just a summary of all these drugs, just for a quick revision, I'll not read them, but uh, I can give you uh, the slides and these are available in all the pharmacology books, okay? And that is all, that is the end. So any question, any comments, anything you want to say? All right, so I guess there is no comment. So we will stop here. And uh, the next topic we have to decide that what we are going to do over the weekend, I've got some curriculum work to do. So I'll let you know tomorrow that uh, uh, which next uh, chapter, uh, maybe, you know, we can go along with endocrinology uh, or if you want, uh, someone said, uh, Bharti said that she, she was interested in uh, dementia. And uh, so in that context, we can do Alzheimer's as well. But anyway, please give me your suggestions. All right. So thank you very much. And I'll see you next time.